kill Tyro, let's go! It is time, everybody, for a brand new edition of the Good Friends Better Enemies podcast. My name is Tyrone, and as always, I am joined by the Byron Saxton to my Corey Graves, Jay. How the fuck are you today, man? Are you ready to talk some NXT? Because you know I am. I am fired up. I sure am, man. I sure am. We are indeed NXT this week. It's pretty exciting stuff. And, uh, boy, you know, the way you brought me in there, <laughs> you made it sound like you are Armando Estrada. My name is Tyrone. I like that a lot. That was fun. Well, I mean, come on, man. It's Christmas week. We got to get in the spirit. The, the, the fat man is going to be coming down the chimney in a couple of days. And I don't mean either you or I, because I feel like we'll get stuck in that situation. But it's time to spread some holiday cheer, some joy, crack an eggnog, if you will. I don't I don't know, whatever people do to celebrate. Do you, babe? Do you? Absolutely. There's some very fun stuff on tap. Looking forward to putting my feet up for a few days, having uh, some great time with family and friends, some eats and some uh, libations as well. It is that time of year that we all get a chance to just hit the pause button for at least a day or two and just uh, revel in some uh, some relaxation. So I'm very much looking forward to that and very much anticipating that. Uh, this week, as aforementioned, ladies and gentlemen, we are covering NXT, specifically the NXT TakeOver London from December 16th, 2015, took place at the SSE Arena in London, England. And we had an attendance of 10,079, which is a huge number for an NXT TakeOver. This was right around the infancy of when NXT really started to uh, come into its own in terms of being a third brand and not just kind of a breeding grand ground for talent. Uh, it's a pretty exciting time for NXT. It is, and it's it's definitely an interesting time frame because this is the only North American NXT takeover that they did in the UK. This would be shortly before the announcement of NXT UK, where we would have a couple of takeovers under that brand with the Blackpool and I believe that there was uh, a Cardiff one, if I'm not mistaken. But this would be the only North American NXT takeover to take place in UK soil. And the one thing that I really like about this show, Jay, I got to say, is you go to, to an American one, you're going to get certain chance for certain people. You go to a Canadian one. You and I have both attended NXTs in Toronto, and they are very vocal there, too, for certain people other than they would in the States. But you go and watch this UK one, and my God. The chance that this crowd was doing, I don't even know what the hell they were saying half the time. They were in their own world, but I was loving every second of it. Yeah, I 100% agree. It kind of had that Raw after WrestleMania vibe going. They were really, really into the action. Um, I think that the UK is always a hot market. I think by virtue of the fact that they don't get frequent trips to the UK. I mean, they get a few times a year. They'll get a tour through the UK and then some other uh, European countries, but uh, they're certainly uh, very much rabid fans for the product, whether it's the goes over there. They love Impact as well. Even uh, during the decline of WCW, when they went over to England and even Australia, uh, they were doing big houses there. So any kind of wrestling content is ex consumed in a very um, kind of prideful and exuberant way in the UK. Tyrone, before we get into the rebooking this week and talk about the surroundings of this particular event, I did want to say something that's kind of off script. I actually haven't brought this to your attention before we went on air tonight, so I'm kind of throwing this at you off the cuff, and I hope you'll work with me. I just wanted to send uh, our best well wishes to Jim Ross. Uh, Jim Ross is going through a really hard time right now. He's battling skin cancer. And uh, as we're speaking right now, he's going through a radiation treatment that I believe lasts the better part of a month. Um, you know, we all know the story of JR and what a great uh, commentator he is and what an imp uh, imp pivotal person and impactful person he's been in the wrestling business. Uh, but we also know that he's gone through a lot. I mean, he's had Bell's palsy a couple of times, several times, actually. I believe he's had attacks of Bell's palsy. And then, of course, in 2017... Uh, about a week before WrestleMania 33, he lost his uh, beloved wife, Jan, uh, and now he's battling skin cancer. So he's been through a lot in the last few years, and I just thought it was important that we, as as a uh, wrestling-based podcast, 
uh, just acknowledge that he's in our thoughts and prayers and that we know he's going to kick out of this. And I can't wait to see him back at the commentary desk at AEW kicking ass and hitting a couple of slobber knockers and boober sumers. Um, and if you haven't tried his barbecue sauce, we're not getting paid for this, folks. But if you haven't tried his barbecue sauce, please try it. It's absolutely delicious. And as you would, I would wash it down with a nice crown royal, as Jim Ross always does. That is correct. JR, you, you, you're the voice of our childhood for the most part. Like you, I, I don't know why I'm speaking to him as he's listening, but the man was a, the, the pivotal voice of our childhood. He was always there on Monday nights. He was there on SmackDowns. He was there every pay-per-view. Then he took sabbatical. Then he was on NXT, which a lot of people forget about. He was one of the first commentators on the uh, televised NXT program. He has done more for this industry than almost anybody else ever could or even ever will. I will go on record saying that. So, yeah, we know you're going to kick out. We'll be waiting for you, buddy. Here's to you. 100%. And as I said, Boomer Sooner. Uh, but with that being said, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we are excited to cover this week's NXT product. Tyrone, this was a labor of love for you this week. I know that you're an NXT fan. Uh, for me personally, it's been a situation where I've been in and out of it. Um, but every time I do watch NXT um, up to the last, say, year or so, I've been really, really excited about the product. Uh, the takeovers never disappoint. You don't even have to necessarily be familiar with the angles or storylines going in because you know you're going to be getting, you know, just incredible ring work. And this particular card was no different. So do you want to walk us through a little bit of what was going on in and around this particular time and what brought us to uh, London, England on this fateful night in December of 2015? Well, we had a few things going on with the company. First of all, I just want to touch on one thing that you said there. You haven't watched NXT recently. It is now NXT 2.0. It is a completely different program that I don't hate. It is getting a lot of hate from, from the wrestling universe, as new things genuinely do. Um, it's not great. It's not bad. They are definitely trying to make a lot of new stars out of it. There is a lot of heavy character-driven things. But give it a shot, guys. That's all I'm saying. Like They, have, they just came off of War Games, which, which was a decent show. It was what it was. Like there was not to me, there wasn't any standout moment on that. But again, we're getting the new faces out there. We're getting the Braun Breakers out there. We're getting the Tony D'Angelo's out there. It's it's working well. But to go back six years with NXT, you had Finn Balor as the NXT champion. No, sorry, Joe, one of the two. Can't remember right now. Um, you had so many in the tag division trying to make names. You had up and coming tag teams such as the Jason Jordan and Chad Gables, who hadn't had been given a name yet. The Dawson and Wilders, who also hadn't been given a name yet. Enzo and Cass. It was kind of becoming the super indie. You had your Sami Zayn, who was injured. Uh, Asuka had just debuted and was about to completely run roughshod on the women's division. Nia Jax was the monster women's heel. Bailey, being the final four horsewoman left in NXT, was the giant face of the division as the champion. You had a few old timers that have kind of gone and come back. Like Emma was back on NXT at this point. It was just a crazy time. Like they really had such a stacked roster of either people that they were trading themselves in the PC or signing from the Indies, a la Samoa Joe, a Kevin Owens, uh, of, of Finn Balor. It's crazy. And we hadn't, we wouldn't even get to the point yet with Adam Cole in the Undisputed Era. Uh, Johnny Gargano was there now, but not really doing much. Same with Tommaso Ciampa. We would get to all of that later. This was really, as you said, kind of the beginning of when takeovers really started to, I guess, take over. We were coming off of the Brooklyn one where Bailey and Sasha had, in my opinion, not just a, the best women's match ever, but one of the best wrestling matches ever. They would go on and have the 30-woman Iron Man match that was also fantastic, one of the first of its kind. I can't speak highly enough about this program at the time. Yeah, I, I agree with everything you just said. Um, I will say as well, aesthetically, I enjoy the product so much. For me, um, we've talked about this on the program a few times. We've also talked about it off-air that I find that 
uh, the current day main roster WWE product ha- is now and has been for some time very uh, visually distracting. There's a lot of visual noise. Everything's LED this and LED that, ring posts, skirts, uh, or ring aprons. Um, even the, the, the walkway or the aisleway at one point was an LED uh, lamp or ramp. So I've, I've kind of liked to go back to this area era in WWE or re- rather wrestling in general with these NXT takeovers where it's very basic. I mean, you have kind of just a Tron as the entranceway. And then, of course, you have the black mats. Um, you have the ring posts. Just The lighting is great. I think they do the house show lighting treatment. They don't put a lot of emphasis on the crowd. It's mainly just a darkened crowd with the lighting of the ring. So I really, really appreciate the actual aesthetic presentation of these NXT takeovers. Mainly because well, I you think that to... it emphasizes the, the the product in the ring as opposed to all the bells and whistles that distract you from from what you're actually watching. Oh, for sure. And one thing that they do, especially lighting wise, that I love at this era, is if it's a main event or a big match feel, the lights all go dark, and it's just a couple of spotlights in the ring to showcase how big of a deal it is for those two competitors to be in there. Yeah. No, they do for sure. So. I think that, uh, you know, to your point earlier about NXT 2.0, I'm certainly not disparaging it whatsoever. I think that uh, there's some really great talent that's up and coming in that particular division right now. And I think that we have a lot of exciting superstars uh, that are uh, coming up as we speak. It's certainly changed quite a bit from what the original vision of NXT was. And and that's many times what it is. It's evolution. Uh, Things progress and things change. Things develop. But I do think that for my personal taste, it's maybe jumped the shark a little bit in terms of its presentation. I wouldn't mind so much if it went back to kind of more of a simplified, um, not bare bones, but kind of just a, a very basic presentation as opposed to making it, uh, you know, this very elaborate uh, lighting spectacle and lasers and, and things of that nature. So, so for those reasons, I, I really appreciated the aesthetics of the show as well, but the in ring work was absolutely outstanding. So I think you have a tall order this week to rebook this event. Actually, I'm very curious to see what you do. Well, here's the thing, Jay, the event was so good. I'm just going to let the cat out of the bag right now. I didn't change anything. So realistically we can end the show right now. All right, so we're going to go home after 13, 13 minutes, and that'll be the, that'll be the record show for us. I did tell you it was going to be a quick show, and I don't know what else you want me to say. I, don't, uh, I wouldn't blame you whatsoever for, for not changing anything. Honestly, there's a lot on this show that's really, really good. I know you're pulling my leg. I'm sure you've changed a fair amount of it, but um, it'd be interesting to see what you've come up with here. Why don't you let us know? Our opening contest scheduled for one fall is a triple threat match for the NXT Tag Team Championship. We have, I'm just going to call them the Revival because that is what they would go on to be known as. The Revival defending their NXT Tag Team Championship against the team of Enzo Amore and Big Cass. And I'm throwing in the up and coming team that you and I both love very, very much, American Alpha. Okay, yeah, I'm okay with that. I don't mind that at all. I mean, on the dark match, we did get a fatal four-way tag team match, and uh, those two gentlemen, Chad Gable and Jason Jordan, were in attendance, so it makes sense to put those two guys on the on the show and put them in the match. Um, I thought this match in canon, Dash and Dawson versus um, Enzo and Cass, was, was very good. It was well-worked. I have in my notes here watching it, I know that you and I are probably going to differ on this because I remember how big of a fan you were of the Enzo and Cass act when it was really hot. Uh, but for me personally, I just am not a fan of Enzo Amore. He's a very talented guy. I'm not going to take anything away from him. But his particular gimmick was just like very much against the grain for me. It rubbed me the wrong way. I didn't like it. That's fair, and I don't really want to talk about 2021, 2022, even 2020 or 2019 Enzo Amore because we all know what's going on there. I, you're right, was a giant fan of Enzo and Cass back then. I was singing along. I was always asking everybody, how you doing? How you doing? Oh, couple haters, couple haters. 
I don't think I screamed as loud for anybody as I did for them when you and I were at a live event. So that just goes to show that I'll take them over a Brock Lesnar. <laughs> but shall we get into how I rebook this? Are you ready? I am 100%. All right. So the match starts with Dawson Wilder, Gable, and Jordan all taking o- or throwing Enzo over the top rope and then a four on one beatdown of Big Cass to get the big man out of the picture right away. Once Cass is out of the ring, Gable and Wilder start hammering each other while Dawson and Jordan brawl on the other side. A reversal of Irish rips runs the revival into each other. Then they turn into a tandem belly-to-belly suplex from Jordan and Gable. As the revival goes down, Enzo is beginning to wake up Cass. Once Cass is on his feet, he becomes that beautiful, angry giant that we know he would, you know. He's seven feet tall, and you can't teach that. Him and Enzo decide to go out, or to go and take out American Alpha. <clears throat> Excuse me. Well, the crowd is going insane. There is so many chants for these guys. There is an SAWFT chant, as we do always with them. Big Cass then proceeds to pick up Scott Dawson, who hits a low blow. Enzo runs over, but the Revival then proceed to hit the Shatter Machine. Dawson pins Enzo, but at the last second, Chad Gable breaks the pin. Jason Jordan is back in, kicks Wilder in the gut, suplexes him over the top rope. American Alpha then hits the amplitude on Dawson. Enzo, back into the ring, then tosses Gable into the steel post while Cass hits a big boot for a one, two, three. Your winners and new tag team champions, Enzo and Cass. Huh. I, I'm not surprised you put the titles on them. And I, I, I will say um, it does make sense, I suppose, based on how over they were at this point. Um, let me ask you something. Do you find or do you think in your recollection, was it that the entrance and the catchphrases were over or were they over as a tag team in the ring as well? Because I think there could be an argument to be made that once they got in ring, they weren't quite you know as over as they would be when they came out and did their whole shtick like what what do you where do you land on that i mean you're 100 percent right on that there's no denying that they weren't exactly the greatest in-ring workers cast did play a decent big man enzo was always good as playing the the little man underdog who knew he had the big dog in his corner if he ever ran his mouth too much but yes they were 100 percent an entrance a catchphrase, and Enzo dancing in the ring. That's what they were. They added Carmella to it, which gave them the the hot ballet, if you will. But when you look at the three teams that I put in this, there's no doubt in my mind that Enzo and Cass are the weakest link, but the most over. And it's really surprising to me that they never, ever actually gave them a tag title run. So I thought, even if it gets taken off of them at the next tapings, why not? Let them have it for a little bit. Yeah, because they would be going on to get called on to the main roster the night after WrestleMania 32. So they weren't going to be in NXT that much longer either. So I can see how this would make sense for you to maybe have them win the titles here and then drop them at the TakeOver in Dallas. That that would maybe make sense. Um, no, I mean, I, and I'm not saying that I, I don't think that uh, Enzo and Cass were necessarily bad workers. They were, they were good hands. It's just... Uh, what I meant to say was, and maybe I didn't articulate it the best, is that I just think that once the bell rang, they weren't over as an actual wrestling tag team. I think that they were more over for, as you said, the entrance and the gimmick. And once they actually got in the ring, a lot of times the crowd would start cheering for the for the real workhorses of the tag team division. I mean, you look at the okay, match yes. the wrestlers in this in this match. I mean, including American Alpha, it's it's a who's who of of technical wrestling. Oh, I, I'm not denying that in any way, shape, or form, but they also would keep cheering for Enzo to make the hot tag to a big cast when he was getting the big da- big beat down. It's not like they stopped cheering for them. They were always there, and when they won, they would still get that huge pop. The only thing I can really compare it to, and again, this is not me disparaging the name of any wrestler because I truly am really good friends with his family, but it's like Bobby Roode. Was Bobby Roode over as a competitor, or was it just because of the glorious entrance? 
I think it, I think it depends on who you ask. I mean, I always liked Bobby Roode as a, as a single star, and I really wish they had done more with him uh, once they got, he got called up to the main roster. I think that, you know, we've talked about this a few times again, and, and I think that it's been said, generally speaking, there's a consensus among wrestling fans that a lot of times there are certain talents that were thriving in NXT that maybe should have just stayed there. I mean, we didn't need to bring everybody up to the main roster. I understand that the, um, the whole point of NXT in, in its infancy was to try to create stars and get them some momentum and learn their skills and learn their trade, learn their craft, and then bring them up to the main roster. But the problem with that is, as we all know, anybody listening to this podcast is going to know exactly what I'm about to say is that they might have a gimmick that's over super strong and on fire in NXT, and then they come up to the main roster and things get changed, and then they lose all their steam. First of all, because a lot of the people that are watching the main roster don't watch NXT. I mean, the casual audience doesn't watch NXT. And the people that do watch NXT are then disenfranchised by the character being changed and, re- and repackaged. So I See, think that... Hold, hold, on, hold on, I need, to, I need to intervene for a second here. I don't think that that's necessarily true that the main roster audience isn't always watching NXT because I know some people who are main roster fans, not really into indies or impact or ring of honor or even AEW for that matter, but they all watched NXT. They all knew who everybody was that was coming up. So while you may be right in some degree, I truly think that more people were watching it than you would know because if they had somebody debut on a Raw or a SmackDown in the middle of the year, I'm not saying the night after Mania. Like, look at when Kevin Owens or Sami Zayn uh, answered John Cena's United States Championship. The crowds went insane for them. I don't know if you're going to say that the, because they're bigger names in NXT, that people knew who they were, or they were indie darlings. But when you talk about that, I think people knew who they were. I also think that when you were getting called up from the main roster, if your gimmick didn't necessarily resonate with the fans of the main roster, if you look at the history, a lot of them are the ones that the company trained themselves in the PC. The ones that were huge on the indies, they got to the main roster. A lot of them are fine. You look at your Finn Balor, you look at your Kevin Owens, you look at your Seth Rollins, you look at your Roman Reigns, your Dean Ambrose, uh, Sami Zayn, there, there's quite a few that did all right. And I think that it's more so the homegrown talent that doesn't always do well up the main roster. No, yeah, you're absolutely right. And I'm not going to disagree whatsoever with what you're saying. The only thing I think my point was is that I think there's a significant part of the audience that watches SmackDown and Raw, not a huge number, but a significant number, a percentage that only watches Raw and SmackDown and doesn't really pay attention to NXT. That was more my point. But anyways, we we digress. I I think this match, the way you booked it and laid it out, all makes great sense. And again, if we're going to stick to our booking, because we will do some more NXT as uh, as the the new year rolls around in 2022, we will be getting into more NXT. So um, for the purposes of doing this, if we're going to keep things in the same kind of vein that we're going to have Enzo and Casket called up to the main roster uh, the night after WrestleMania 32, then that to me builds up a great storyline that we can tell over the next few months until we get to, uh, to Dallas. So I think it's a great booking choice. Good on you, man. Well, thank you, sir. I'm glad that you're being a lot more nice to me than I was to you last week. I apologize for getting you so fired up. And I swear I decided not to give you the thumbs down and the negative comment on the YouTube page. Just, I, there was no need. There was no need to rub salt in the wound. Well, thank you. I, I wish you had told me before, though, because I lost a lot of nights of sleep about it, so. I, I, I highly doubt you did, but are you ready to go on to the next one? What was the next match on the original card there, Jay? Uh, the next match on the card was... Um, actually it was supposed to be the opening contest was supposed to be Oscar versus Emma. So you switched the opening contest to be the triple threat tag for the NXT tag team championships. So I wonder if you still have Oscar on the card, if you've kept Emma, if you've swapped things around, what do you have next for me there, pal? Next matchup I have for you is Oscar going one-on-one with everybody's favorite Eva Marie. 
okay, so this is just going to be a total squash. Oh, it's 100% just like a three-minute squash of Asuka just dominating, kicking her in the face, hit-checking her, throwing her around. It's it's just to showcase Asuka to keep the undefeated streak going, put her on the card. It's also not going to hurt Eva Marie because they're building Asuka up to, the, to be the monster that she would become. Eva Marie, everybody fucking hated her, especially at this time. So why not have Asuka go out and just wipe the floor with her? So is Emma still on this card or no? Look, we'll get down the road if we need to, okay? I can't promise you if she is or if she isn't. Okay, well, I was just going to say that if she's not, then I would like to just briefly touch on Emma and just uh, say that I think at this particular juncture in her career, she was really coming into her own as a gimmick and as a character. Uh, If you look at the way that her... um, character had evolved throughout the last couple of years i mean even the uh, the way that her entrance music changed started wearing those sunglasses she had a different attitude she was playing a really good heel i think emma is a very very underrated in-ring talent she was trained by lance storm if i'm not mistaken um and she is she brings a lot to the table she's obviously um you know a very solid in-ring worker she has a great presentation uh you know very very obviously good looking athlete so i think that um I think that she deserves a little bit more credit than she gets in terms of um, where she stands in the uh, in the, the the hierarchy of women's wrestling today. And as far as this match you've booked, I think it makes all the sense. I mean, I know that this comparison is going to be a bit of a stretch for you, but you're almost giving Oscar the Goldberg treatment in this way that you have her on the pay per view, you have her squash someone like an Eva Marie, and then she goes on to bigger and better things. So I, I'm fine with this booking too. I don't think that's a stretch at all. I think that's exactly what I was going for. And I don't know if you clued into kind of why I put Eva Marie against her, but you had Asuka versus Emma originally. Emma gave up on the, on the what was it? Emma, Emma, Emma Lucian or Emma? I can't even remember what the name of her stupid gimmick was going to be. Emma Lena? Was that what it was? Emma Lena. Emma Lena, yeah. yeah. So I decided to put her against what kind of was Emelina with Eva Marie. That way we can completely wash our hands clean of the Emelina gimmick to my, in my eyes. Yeah, that was a weird one because they, they were pushing that Emelina thing um, and then nothing came of it. She just ended up going back to being Emma again. So I don't really know why. I mean, it was just basically a barrage of, of, uh, of, photo shoots from from beaches and her in her bathing suit and things like that so it was i think they were trying to kind of build towards to your point that kind of eva marie type character kind of like what they're doing with with carmella right now uh in a way so i i, I do f- see where you're going with that but i i think because they they repackaged emma into being this really really convincing heel i i do think that uh that you did a good service by taking her off of this particular match just for the sake that I think Emma could contribute in a different way other than being uh, gone through in short order by Asuka. So I like this booking. Well, thanks, Pally. Why don't you tell me what we have up next and we can keep this ball rolling. Next up, we have, it's supposed to be Baron Corbin versus Apollo Crews. And before you get into your booking here, I will say, um, Apollo Crews was really over with this crowd. Yeah, I feel like Apollo Crews is that weird talent because when he was in PWG and on the Indies as UHA Nation, everybody loved him. He signed with NXT. Everybody was excited to see him. Then he started working, and his his in-ring work is fantastic. But I don't know if it's because he was kind of lacking a character and character development and personality. But to me, nothing really clicked with him. He was dynamite in the ring, but it's kind of like what, what happened to Austin Aries in, in NXT again, a dynamite worker, but really didn't go anywhere. And what, like, does that make sense to you? Do you, do you think that's kind of true or no? Yeah, I, I guess to a degree. I mean, what? Do you want to expand on it a little bit? What exactly you're you're kind of driving at? I I just truly think that the fans were all behind him because they knew who he was from the indies. But once he started working in NXT, it's almost like they kind of started to give up on him because it seemed like the company 
wasn't doing anything with him. Kind of like the Cassius Ono treatment. Kind of like, um, oh, fuck, there's another one that was almost um, Hideo Itami. Just quite a few of them that just never really got to where they should have been. Yeah, that's fair. I mean, <clears throat> I, I will make a, make a comparison. I kind of, a, a weird one, but I think that you'll understand where I'm going with this when I connect the dots. So I think that there's been so many times that we have seen, for example, during Royal Rumble season, that you see the weeks and months uh, leading up to Royal Rumble that the fans are really getting behind a particular superstar. Someone that they're really eager to see get to the next level. And then you see like, that like, guy. I know, exact, I know exactly where you're going. I feel like I know exactly where you're going with this right now. Yeah, so then you see that guy go in and have a very convincing showing at the Royal Rumble. Whether they win it or not, but they start you know, throwing out 100 guys. Uh, a lot of times they will go on to win the match. And then suddenly when they get that accolade um, and they, they are on the road to WrestleMania to face the champion, the fans turn on them. It, this to me is kind of the same thing. People are really encouraging them. I can't wait to see you when you get to the main show. Can't wait to you see, to see you when you get called up and get out of the indie circuit. Get called up for, and move from ROH to NXT and then NXT to the main roster. And then when they get to that point, they all sit on their hands. Does that kind of compare to you? I don't really see that with an indie type person. Like the way that you, you describe that with like, everybody having their back and then they win the match or something like that. To me, that just sounded like Batista when they really wanted Brian to win. No, no, I, I, I understand that, but I'm just saying that it, to me, it's sort of the, the two overlap in that sense that I kind of feel like, so, um, okay, well, you know what? I'm going to say something a little controversial here. And if I, if people get mad at me, then I'll, then they can get mad at me. Um, I think, feel like sometimes when I look at social media, WW, like wrestling social media, the internet wrestling community, I feel like there is always, when we have these cuts and releases, there's this huge outrage. Oh, you let this person go. Oh, you let that person go. Oh, you let this person go. And I feel bad for anybody that loses their job. And I don't mean to minimize whatsoever anybody losing their job or being, uh, you know, released out of their contract. But what I do find sometimes a little bit over the top is this false outrage that I see online. It's like, what have you done to support this person when they were in the company? What did you, were you buying their merch? Were you doing things to try to get them along? I just feel like sometimes not everybody, please understand I am not painting everybody with one particular brush stroke, but I am saying that there are some people out there that just feign outrage when this stuff happens and they've really done nothing to support the person that they're upset with. Hey man, I at least bought a couple of fiend t-shirts and things like that, but I, I a hundred percent get where you're coming from. It's, it's the self entitlement that a lot of wrestling fans have because they watch these programs and because they think that they're, when they go to a show, they kind of get to be involved and they chant and this and that. It's like, how dare they, how dare they do that? If you're watching a Batman movie and Christian Bale, let's use him as an example. If he got recast, is there going to be a bit of outrage? Probably. But at the same time, is it still going to go on and make $500 million at the box office? Of course. So it doesn't really fucking matter because all the people who bitched and complained that they weren't going to go or all the people right now who are saying boycott WWE, boycott this, they're still watching. They're still giving them their money for the network. They're still ordering merch. You know this just as well as I do. I 100% know that. And, so, you know, I wasn't expecting to even get into the sidebar, but, you know, we are famous for our sidebars. So, you know what? I'm going to let it rip here. I, I, do, I do agree with you 100%. And I also think that, you know, you do have that, that false sense of outrage when, when these people are cut. But then again, to your point, they are going to go and watch the show. They're not going to boycott the show. To me, it's a... A, almost a pack animal men mentality that you need to pile on. So you see that there's this tweet and then you find out that people are, are released. And again, I, um, I, I have all the sympathy in the world for anybody that loses their job. I'm, I'm, I feel horrible about it. And I, I don't want to minimalize that whatsoever, but honestly, Tyrone, like you and I have talked about this, we've seen some cuts 
in the last few few actually the better part of 2021 we've seen cuts and we've seen these lists and there are a good number of names i have never heard of and people are like freaking out because these particular names have been cut and unless it's somebody that maybe i'm just completely clueless or obtuse to i don't think that the the outrage or the the crying for you know Vince McMahon's head I don't think it's genuine I think it's a bunch of bullshit and I think it's people just trying to put themselves over online well yeah of course it is it's social media it's 2021 this is what people do they're keyboard warriors you want to go and bitch about something you're gonna do it you want to leave a bad review on a movie or a restaurant or a takeout service that didn't deliver you your french fries hot enough for you you're gonna do it and you're gonna bitch about it you have 180 characters to do it and everyone's doing it because they think it's going to make them some woke social justice warrior which in reality it makes you a goddamn idiot i'm sorry but it, it's true i in my 35 years i have never written a bad review on a movie i don't do bad reviews on restaurants because you know what? Everybody has a bad day. Everybody makes a mistake. So what's the point in trying to harp on it over and over again? You, oh, I'm sorry. You were pissed off that Mia Yim and Keith Lee got released from WWE. You know what? I wasn't the happiest about it. I That one was a head scratcher, but hey, guess what, guys? They're going to be okay. They're going to bounce back on their feet. You don't think that there's a bunch of people clamoring to either sign them or book them on the indies. Everything's going to be fine for these guys. Yep. A hundred percent. And so I just, uh, I don't know. I, I just, I think it's hypocrisy. I think that, you know, 99.9% of people that, that, that lash out about how the company's direction is. And listen, I am not the biggest fan of the company's direction right now. I'm not particularly interested in what they're doing. Will I check out the big four events? Yeah, I watch Survivor Series. Yeah, I watch SummerSlam. I'm going to watch Rumble. I'm going to watch Mania. But you know what I did, folks? And Tyrone, you know this, and I think that you've done it a little bit yourself. You know what I did when I was dissatisfied with what I watched on TV? I changed the channel. I didn't go online and bitch and complain and talk about how much I hate it. I, there's no pleasing wrestling fans. There's no pleasing you. It doesn't matter. CM Punk's a perfect example. We talked about this. Actually, I talked about it before uh, in the summertime when he made his re-debut. People, he was wrestling at uh, the, the September pay-per-view for AEW. And people were so excited to see him back. And then he comes back. And then he wrestles. And all people could talk about was the fact that he wasn't wearing trunks. He was wearing tights. It's like there's no pleasing these people. Anyways, I, I don't know why we got onto this 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 rant, but... Oh man, it just See, I think I'm, it's because of the no, NXT product. I I definitely am a little different. I don't turn off the channel. I get out a pen and paper and I write to my WWE PO box and I hope that they write back to me. Because <laughs> god damn it, they need to hear what's wrong. Perfect. That sounds great. Send it to Jack Tunney's office. I like that. I'm still I'm still waiting for Todd Bettengale to get back to me, but I mean, hey, he'll get there sooner or later. No, he sure will. He sure will. It's it's snail mail, man. It's going to take a while. Anyways, folks, sorry about the rant. I know that's unusual for me. I don't typically uh, get fired up like that, but I just felt like it needed to be said. And I, I think that, you know, again, folks, if you're listening to this podcast, you're obviously passionate about wrestling as Tyrone and I are. And um, I just, uh, I think that it's, there's, there's a time and place to be vocal and there's definitely opportunity for you to speak your mind. There's nothing wrong with having an opinion and voicing it. But I just think sometimes, you know, people tend to pile on unnecessarily so. And uh, we're very grateful that you've chosen to spend this time with us and listen to us, you know, blather on about all kinds of things, wrestling and NXT related. But um, anyhow, back to our regularly scheduled programming. What do you have for me in this particular match, pal? Okay, so things are going to get a little weird here. So stick with me, okay? Baron Corbin is out in the ring. He is out there saying that there is no competition for him. Everybody in NXT is pathetic. There's nobody in the, on the roster that he can beat or that can't, he can't beat. So he issues an open challenge to anybody outside of NXT. All of a sudden, a little weird music hits. The crowd's kind of silent. And out from the entranceway walks Cowboy James Storm. 
Storm comes down. Baron Corbin is very, very confused. Doesn't know what to do. Storm looks right, looks him right in the eye, takes a swig out of his beer bottle, spits it in Corbin's face, and we're off to the races. Uh, it's all Storm knocking him around the ring till Corbin finally gets out of the ring, walks around the ring. Storm is out there trying to chase him. Corbin does the chicken shit heel move of hopping back in the ring and then stomping on him as soon as he gets in. It's back and forth, back and forth, till finally James Storm just decides he's going to beat the living hell out of him. There is no stopping him. Punch, kick, slam, every move that he can do, it's pretty much a brawl. Corbin, frustrated and beat up, gets rolled out to the outside, picks up a steel chair, comes back in and clocks James Storm with it for the DQ finish. As that's going on, Corbin continues to beat the living hell out of him with the chair. All the referees are now out trying to pull Corbin off. He pushes them away. As that happens, he goes to swing at Storm again. Storm ducks, grabs the chair from him, hits Corbin. Corbin then retreats up the aisle. Storm is standing strong but beaten in the middle of the ring as the crowd is chanting for him. Okay. Yeah, that's uh, that's solid booking. Uh, I get it. I know that James Storm had a couple of, I think, two separate runs in NXT. He came in once and then he left and then he came in a second time. So yeah, I uh, I'm I'm good with that. I think James Storm would be a, a welcome addition to the NXT roster. Um, <clears throat> I have to ask you though, with Baron Corbin's entrance music, was it the one with the with the motorcycle, or did you change that up? I thought that was a bit of a head scratcher that that particular entrance. No, thing. it's it's still the motorcycle fucking lone wolf horrible skullet that he had going on back then. I don't get me wrong, I really like Corbin. I have never. Hated him. I like the Constable Corbin. I like King Corbin. I like, I kind of even like Happy Corbin. I like Down on His Luck Corbin. I did not like Lone Wolf Baron Corbin. And I'm not going to lie, it was aesthetics for me. I could not get past that hair. Yeah. Um, I will say that uh, low key, uh, Jim Johnston's version of um, Baron Corbin's entrance theme, which I believe is the last theme that Johnson wrote for the company is one of my favorite themes of the, like the last five years. It was a really, really good theme. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I agree with you once he shaved his head and, and, uh, kind of changed his look up a little bit. He was, he, he looked a little bit more, more presentable as a, as a more polished, let's put it that way. I also thought that with enough build again, we're fast forwarding quite a bit here with enough build, having him as Kurt Angle's final opponent wouldn't have been terrible. Now, the fact that it was just done the way it was, I wasn't a fan of. But if you had actually spent some time booking that up, had Angle beat him a couple of times, had Corbin beat him a couple of times, I know they had worked a few times. But if we made this a focal point feud, the retirement match would have meant something. Well, I think um, the operative word for um, or the words for this uh, this particular episode of the Good Friends, Better Enemies podcast is head scratcher because we talk about Kurt Angle. I mean, Kurt Angle's final run in the company leading up to his final match against Baron Corbin was indeed a head scratcher. I didn't understand the booking of it. Uh, he was doing a lot of jobs for younger talent, which I'm completely fine with, but in terms of getting him to that point where you're going to give him that final um, retirement match, I really thought that he should have been booked a lot more strongly than he was. Uh, and of course, I also think that, the fact that he kind of already had requested and handpicked his opponent that he wasn't given. I don't know. I, I, I think that Kurt Angle himself has said that he's not particularly bowled over by the, the match and the presentation that he had at, at his final uh, WrestleMania encounter. And it has nothing to do with Baron Corbin. It's just to your point, the way that the match was structured. So had uh, Corbin been kind of given more, of a push and had a little bit more gravitas going into that particular event. I do agree. It might've made a big difference in their final match. I also do want to stress just for our future bookings and our fun universe, just because James storm is on this card does not mean that James storm signs with NXT. It's kind of like a Jushin Liger situation one and done, but I figured because storm technically was, on the roster without being signed. That's why I turned it into him issuing the open challenge for anybody not on the NXT roster. Storm comes out. 
We probably will see him once or twice again, but that's going to be it. He is going to re-sign with Impact just like he did. Yeah, and that's totally fine. I think that you can get a couple of fun matches out of him, especially with the particular people that were on NXT's roster at this point. I mean, you have to look at the roster, um, I would say consistently for the last four or five years, six years, the NXT roster has been absolutely stacked. Uh, I wouldn't say necessarily at this point right now, they are as much. We're talking about 2021 going into 2022. I think that we're in a rebuilding phase with NXT right now. But at this point with James Storm, you could have had some real, you know, barn burner matches and hard hitting matches before he went back to impact for sure. And think about the fact that if he was there when fucking Bobby Roode came in, we could get a reunion of the two of them. That would have been incredible. Even opponents or partners. I don't really care. Yeah, no, that would have been fun. I, I do agree with that for sure. Um, so the next match on our card, if you're all finished with that one, good booking on that one, by the way, uh, would be Bailey defeating Nia Jax by submission for the NXT Women's Championship. Now, before you tell us what you booked your Tyrone, I do have to say that I think this might have been Nia Jax's best match I ever saw her have. This was a really, really well-worked match on Nia Jax's part. And, of course, Bailey was really good as well. She's always, you know, on fire. So what do you have for me on this one? Okay, so I don't want to hate on anybody ever, but I will right now. Saying that this is the best Nia Jax match you've ever seen is like saying that Haggis is the best meal you've ever had at a sheep's intestine. It's just what it is. It's Nia Jax. As far as I'm concerned, if I'm ever rebooking, Nia Jax is probably never going to be on the card. She's not like most girls. She hurts people. So, in place, I have the reigning, defending NXT Women's Champion. Ladies and gentlemen, as they said, this is Bailey going one-on-one -on -one with the one, the only, accompanied to the ring by Dana Brooke, Emma. Oh, I like that booking a lot. I, that's a match I would love to see. Uh, before you get into it, I will just go back to Nia Jax for a second, though. I uh, agree with what you're saying to somewhat of a degree, but I will also counter that by saying that I don't necessarily think that that was so much Nia Jax's fault. If she wasn't ready to be in a, put in a spot that she was put in, she shouldn't have been on the card. She should have main, stayed at the PC. So I feel like there's a little bit of blame to go all around for that. If she was indeed hurting people... As we have heard, okay. quote unquote, I think that she, uh, okay. you know, there, there's a little yes. bit of onus I'm, on a lot of people. No, I'm, 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 I'm going to stop you right now just because, sure, if that were the case for the first time or two, well, potentially still in NXT or early into a run, then yeah, of course. But pretty much up until 2021, she was still hurting people. I don't understand how much more they could have given her. Like, how much more training does she need? She had been with the company by this point for like six, seven years and still hurting people. So I do not agree with that point at all. Well, okay. So, but then again, that, that would also kind of one hand washing the other here. If that's the case that she is hurting people, then why is she still on the roster? Why, why are they still allowing her to compete? She's not anymore. She's I know not she's anymore. not anymore. I know she's not anymore, but I'm saying that if that's indeed the case that she was still hurting people up until recently or however long it's been, it's not her fault that she's being booked and she's not going to say, no, don't book no, no. me. So oh, you're, you're right in that aspect. It's not her fault. She's being booked at all. And I truly do believe that she kept her job as long as she did and stayed in a semi main event role for as long as she did because of her family heritage. I hate to say it, but that's exactly why I think she got to where she is. Yeah, I, I, I don't necessarily agree with that. I, I, do, I do understand your point. I don't necessarily agree with it. Um, anyways, we, can, we could go back into this rabbit hole another time. I know we're getting, getting off into another sidebar oh. here, folks. So tell me about Emma oh, yeah, and Bailey. Totally. I want to hear about this. Well, see, here's the thing, Jay. It is a complete barn burner of a match. It starts off with Emma kind of playing the heel standing in the corner, doing the into the ropes, rope break, oh, can't get me, can't get me, 
Finally, Dana Brooke gets up on the apron to kind of distract ba- uh, Bailey as Emma is in the corner talking to the referee. Dana Brooke then clocks Bailey, knocks her down, so Emma runs right over, goes straight into the pin, thinking she's got the title right away. One, two, kick out. It's all Emma for a little while. A lot of lot of hip, uh, hip tosses, a lot of uh, off the rope Irish rips. She hits a, an amazing spine buster on Bailey. She goes up to the second rope, going for an elbow. As that happens, Bailey rolls out of the way. Bailey's starting to get the momentum as the crowd is behind her, going, "Hey, we want some Bailey." I like how I did the chant. By the way, I'm talking to myself now too, and I know that it's okay. Anyway, the match continues as Bailey is finally getting back to her feet. Emma's trying to get back to her feet after missing the elbow. It kind of goes into that getting up, hitting each other, hitting each other, hitting each other. Bailey gets the upper hand, slaps her a few times, chops her a few times, throws her into the corner, runs at her shoulder first, gets her there. She kind of rolls onto the ground. Bailey then goes up to the top rope, does the Macho Man elbow off the top. One, two, kick out. At that point, Dana Brooke is back up on the apron, trying to interfere. As that happens, Nia Jax appears out of nowhere. I know I said I wouldn't book her, but I said I wouldn't book her in a match. Nia Jax is out there, throws the NXT Women's Championship in the ring for Emma to hit Bailey with. As she goes for that, she goes to hit her, ducks, belt hits the ground. Bailey hits a Bailey to belly on top of the belt, unbeknownst to her because we know she is white meat baby face. One, two, three, and still NXT Women's Champion Bailey. Yeah, that sounds like a good match. I mean, so far, um, this whole card has been booked quite well. I mean, in terms of the actual card that took place, it was a really, really solid outing. So for you to improve upon it is actually quite good. So you're doing really well with the particular booking this week. Uh, This match would be something I would have loved to see, especially uh, in this crowd on this night, in this atmosphere would have been really, really spectacular. And again... Uh, we talked about it earlier in terms of my my fandom of Emma. I think that she plays the heel character, the heel um, the heel persona that she adopted at this point in her her career was was being portrayed so well by her. Uh, was she accompanied by Dana no, Brooke on. as well? She, she was. I did mention that at the top, but um, I gotta say the one thing with this heel Emma that I did not like at all, and you'll probably argue it again. Aesthetics. It's me. Didn't like the gloves. Oh, see, I like the gloves. I think the gloves, for some reason, kind of make you. It, it is. It's a heel thing to wear the gloves. I find. I. I. Uh, I don't know. In a weird way, it kind of reminded me of like Jake the Snake. I know that Jake the Snake didn't wear gloves really, but uh, for some reason, it just uh, gave me this. It added something for me. I don't know. Well, I'm going to stop you right there because Jake did wear a glove, and that was a coal miner's glove. So maybe that's the match I should have booked. Yeah, well, that's that might be it, actually. It's just something to do with the glove and the sunglasses. And I think that uh, I, there's I think the gloves added to the heel character for me anyways, aesthetically. But I get your point. Uh, you know, it's a small thing, but um, we all have those little idiosyncrasies and things that we would nitpick about certain presentations. I, there's certain you know aspects of people's ring gear that you might not be particular fan of. There's certain things that I don't particularly like either, but you know it's a small thing. But this this match, yeah, that's a really good booking, and uh, I think that this match would have been, you know, a real you know firecracker on this particular card. Well, I appreciate that, and I agree. I think that Bailey sometimes gets overlooked as. Because she is one of the original four horsewomen of NXT with Charlotte, Becky, and Sasha. But they all went on to have, like, such great careers on the main roster. Not that Bailey has not. Trust me. She is the longest reigning SmackDown Women's Champion of all time. But it wasn't until she turned heel that I feel like she really got her footing. She's an example of getting called up to the main roster with a gimmick that worked in NXT, but really didn't get over with the fans as much as they wanted to on the main roster. So seeing her here as the last of the four horsewomen, kind of, I don't want to say grooming, but helping get the next generation of women ready. I know Emma was technically previous, but when she did work with Nia, going into Asuka, working with Carmella, things like that, like Bailey was 
the rock of NXT at this point. And I don't mean Dwayne Johnson, the rock. I mean, like she was the actual rock. Yeah. So she was like the workhorse in your mind. She was the constant. She was the consistent, uh, women's competitor that you would always rely on to get a good match. She was, uh, you know, to the lack of a better term, she was the Bret Hart of the, uh, of the women's division at this point, you could always count on, on, on her to, to deliver a really solid match. Yeah, with a it, great story. If it were 1991, she would have held the intercontinental championship. Yeah. Oh, I a hundred percent agree with that. That's a great comparison for sure. She was almost the, maybe the Hennig, the Kurt Hennig of this particular era. You know that you could and, always, you could always count on, on, uh, on her to, to deliver the goods. Oh, for sure. For sure. And I'm going to go out and say this and I will stand by this out of the four horsewomen of NXT. Bailey is my favorite. Always has been always will be never really been a big Charlotte fan. I can respect what she's done. Becky is entertaining, and I do enjoy her. Sasha, great in-ring worker, but to me, Bailey is the whole package. She, like, you look at that heel work. Anybody, almost anybody else just making ding-dong hello would be the most annoying thing in the world. Was it annoying for her? Yes, but it worked. During the pandemic era of working in the PC, she was still entertaining even while being super annoying it's a fine line to work or it's a fine line to walk and she nailed it um i can't ne- say that i necessarily disagree with you i think that uh she did such a great job being the aw shucks white meat baby face like you said earlier i think that she did a really good job doing that and i, I think that you'll find throughout the history and lineage of wrestling it's not always the case but often the case that the more convincing and really kind of, gra- uh, what's the word I'm looking for, um, compelling uh, face that you are, a lot of times you're able to switch that and become an extremely effective heel. I mean, probably the greatest face slash heel in the history of wrestling is probably Hulk Hogan. I mean, if you look at the success that he had as a uh-huh. face and then as a heel. A hundred percent. You You can't really argue that. It's Hogan and then maybe... Maybe Shawn Michaels is up there too, but yeah, Hogan was the definition of the white meat baby face. He was the take your vitamins, say your prayers, do your training. I know I completely botched that order, but you know what I'm trying to say? And then that turned into, I did it all for the money. The NWO is too sweet. We're taking over Jack. And it was fantastic because he was just as over as a heel. And that's what I'm saying. That's my point is I think that's the reason why a a competitor and an athlete, a performer like Bailey is able to ascend to such a high level as a, as a heel is because she was such a convincing face. Now, not every performer is like that. I mean, if you look at the Steve Austin's of the world or even the rocks of the world to, to, uh, to, a to a lesser degree, if you look at their, their runs as faces, they far surpass their runs as fair faces or character baby faces than they did as heels. But with Bailey and in her particular case, I think that she has that ability to switch the psychology and she gets it in a way that, uh, because she resonated so viscerally with the segment of the audience that was behind her with the Bailey buddies. And, you know, you saw young girls in the crowd with their hair done in the ponytail the same way and the t-shirts and the streamers and all the rest for her to turn heel and take that, literally take an ax to her street, her Bailey buddies and cut her hair off and become this just, uh, MVP of the COVID era, the, the pandemic era of WWE programming. I firmly stand behind that, and I completely agree with you. I think in terms of the last couple of years, especially throughout the pandemic era of WWE programming in the Thunderdome, there was no better female competitor on the roster than Bailey. Dude, I don't even think we need to say female competitor. I think she, her and Randy Orton, to me, were the pandemic era. The two of them were the most entertaining, the most reliable in the ring every single time, doing whatever they had to do and getting it over. I know, again, we're getting off tra- topic and getting ahead of ourselves, but those two are the two. When I think pandemic era, I think Orton and Bailey. Yep. No, I, I can't I can't argue with that. I, I think that you're right on the money with that. I think those two. And I mean, Orton's resume speaks for itself. We don't need to get into a, a whole laundry list of his accomplishments. But in terms of Bailey, I think that she really, really helped elevate her character and helped elevate some other 
particular, you know, female stars. And I, I don't mean to brand her as, oh, you know, greatest female star of the pandemic era. I wasn't meaning it in, in you know, framing it in a, in, a, in a sex type way. I was just saying more along the lines of because there were male competitors that were on her level. But you look at the male competitors like a Randy Orton, that was that they were sort of equally having equal footing in terms of how good they were during that era. Orton has 20 plus years experience. Bailey is, you know, a shy of that by a fair margin. So it's really interesting to see how far Bailey's game has elevated since she turned heel. I think she's really put all the pieces together. That is quite possibly the most perfect way you could have said that. And God damn it, I couldn't agree more. Now, we have one more match left on this card, Jay. And it is our main event for the NXT Championship. Are you ready for I this, mean, motherfucker? I am. It's Finn Balor, your champion, defeating Samoa Joe for this NXT Championship in a singles match. And this, again, this was one of those NXT main events where I was just captivated from bell to bell so i'm be very curious to see if you change this thing up or not not a damn thing changes the match stays the same finn balor wins he's still the demon he still comes out with the jack the ripper outfit which i thought was great being in london i can't change this it's it's joe and balor they're two of the greatest of this generation i know you agree with me on this Oh, I 100% do. And this match was absolutely riveting. Um, I kind of forgot that this was at the point with Balor's uh, demon character that um, he was, it wasn't quite developed exactly to where we would see it a little bit further along. It was quite, it was kind of at its infancy at this point. So it was interesting to see how it's evolved throughout. Even the music has evolved. And uh, clearly through talking... Well, Hold on, hold, hold on, hold on. It was in the infancy of WWE, but when he was in New Japan, he would still pull out the demon gimmick. No, but that's what I meant in terms of, you know, the WWE presentation. It would evolve into something a little bit more grandiose uh, down the road. And, you know, I, I've i mentioned this a couple of times. I've brought up music and aesthetics and lighting a couple of times. I, I think that uh, it's important in terms of my fandom, I think in yours as well, that the presentation be a certain way. So I really pay attention to things like that, the entrance music, the lighting treatment, um, and things of that nature, you know, pyro now that we have it back, things like that. But I, 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 do, I do really, really enjoy this demon character. I also love that it only comes out a few times. I don't remember the last time we saw it. So um, it's nice that it comes back sparingly. Um, we saw it recently, actually, with, um, was it SummerSlam? Did we see it at SummerSlam when we were together? Maybe not. We definitely saw it this year once. And I can't remember when it was because I'm terrible. And I can't remember who it was against because, again, I'm terrible. <laughs> well, oh, you know, no, 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 no. It was against it was against Roman on an episode of SmackDown. And then they had that horrible ending to the match where it just like the ring broke or something like that. It was a no contest. Yeah, I, I so I didn't watch that again. It was something we've talked about this a couple of times in recent uh, recent memory and recent uh, episodes that my my fandom kind of goes in and out. I, I pay attention to what's going on around the big four. And then, you know, weekly, I'm not really all that invested these days. Uh, and I I have no shame in saying that whatsoever. So um, for those purposes, a lot of the different intricacies of angles that uh, that happen weekly on WWE television really kind of go over my head. That's why. Now, more than ever, as a wrestling fan, I really appreciate the, the the packages. I mean, I watched Survivor Series, and I was caught up to date with the video packages. Before, I used to think they were a big pain in the ass. It's like, if why are you watching this if you don't know what's going on? And now I really appreciate it because I don't know what's going on. So um, I understand what's going on based on, you know, the Internet and, and stuff. I, I follow up on Twitter, and, and I see what's happening on weekly shows from the various companies' websites and, and Twitter feeds. But... No, those packages are great. Oh, 100%. They, they definitely save lives to a degree in a weird way. But I got to say, man, I, I also get a lot of it from Instagram these days because Monday Night Raw ends. I go to bed. I go to bed really early, guys. Tyrone's an old man. He likes to be in bed by 9, 930 if he can. So when I wake up at 630 in the morning, I open my phone, check Instagram, 
Oh, I see what happened on Raw. Oh, I see what's going on. Oh, I see what the next match at the pay-per-view is. Do I PVR at all still? Yeah, because I'm old and still have cable. But I know what I got. <laughs> but I know I, I know exactly what I got to watch and where I can fast forward through and how I can skip through another 17-minute Drew McIntyre promo if I need to. Yeah, you know, it's so funny you mentioned that because I have cable as well and I PVR. I have it scheduled every every week I PVR it. And most of the time I just every like month and a half or so just delete it all. So I uh, I do pay attention to what's going on much like you. And if there's something that really piques my interest, then I'll go back and watch the recording. I know I have it. Um, but, you know, the majority of our podcast is about nostalgia, enjoying the feel good moments that that we both experienced uh, either together or in separately. So it's uh, it's a lot of fun to go back. This is coming closer to the modern era with 2015. I really enjoyed this uh, this particular look back at this card. It was a lot of fun. You took a card that was already really good and made it even better. So I am going to flip the script on you here uh, as against what you did to me last week. I am going to give you a big thumbs up, man. You did a good job. You know what, dude? Thank you. I appreciate that. And I think you can actually hear it in the energy of my excitement today, I really enjoyed actually finally getting a chance to do an NXT show. Something yeah. we haven't done. We always go Fed or WCW for the most part, which is fine because that's our wheelhouse. Every now and then throwing something else in there is really fun. And I think going forward in 2022, you and I were talking, we're going to try and cover a couple other things. Yeah, and I definitely, now that we've uh, we've kind of open the floodgates with NXT. I think that we should definitely revisit some more uh, takeovers throughout the next year or so. Uh, the fun thing about those two is that they're not exclusive to the big four as they were originally. Now you see going to see some more that are kind of in June and, and, and stuff like that sometimes in September. So um, I think it's fun to go and revisit some of these along the lines and, and uh, you know, start maybe, creating a through line with our uh, with our NXT booking as well might be something promising to look forward to in the near future. But I have to say, now that we're putting the lid back on the uh, bottle here, uh, or rather the lid back on the, on the jar here for NXT, uh, what do you have for me next week? I'm curious to see. I have a feeling I know where we're going with this, but I'm not 100% sure. Well, it's really not that hard to think about when you... When you see the theme of our show, we like to go and kind of drop an episode around the same time frame as the other show would have existed. So if we look forward to next week, I do believe it is the 23rd, 24th anniversary of Starcade. So you are getting WCW Starcade 1997. Hollywood, Hulk Hogan, and Sting. Pal, we already covered WCW Starcade 1998. I'm sorry, last I year. got my year wrong. We are going 1998. Yes, yes, we are. We are the not going to rebook the, end, the Starcade. The end of the streak is what we're going with. Well, says you. We'll see what happens when I get my mitts on this thing. Um, yeah, you know what? This is something I feel like I want to keep this as a tradition. I'm saying this off, uh, you know, off the cuff right now. We didn't talk about this off air, but I want to do a Starcade for this kind of areas episode every year. I like doing Starcade as our first, you know, post Christmas um, episode. I really like that tradition of doing a Starcade. I like Starcade as a tradition, and so uh, I think we what you're saying is Starcade is our new Boxing Day Madison Square Garden tradition. Yeah, I mean, if we're going to do it, mean, if it t typically ends up being right around that time that that's when Starcade would take place. So I'm all for that. And there's there's enough Starcades to keep us going for a while. So I, I, yeah, I like this tradition and I'm excited to book this. I think that there's a lot of intriguing possibilities and a lot of ways that we can go into 1999 with WCW and either keep the landscape the same or change things up. I, I This is going to be interesting to uh, to go back and revisit. Well, there you have it, kids. Do you think that Jay will end 2021 on a high note with me, or will he make me almost as pissed off as he did last week? Which is great, because when I get pissed off by him, I'm able to really push his buttons. And I don't know if you heard it last week, guys, but Jay was shoot hot at me for a little while. 
he didn't talk to me for a day or two afterwards, and it made me laugh. Well, it's better to be pissed off than pissed on, Tyrone. So, I mean, take that for what it is. Well, I couldn't agree more. And I think with that wonderful saying, that is how we're going to put a wrap on NXT London's TakeOver. I thoroughly enjoyed booking this. It sounds like Jay really enjoyed my booking of it. And next week, we are going to hear what Jay can do with Starcade 98. Are we going to get a fucking shot? What was it? A cattle prod or whatever he used to kill Goldberg? Are we going to get that? I don't know. It's Jay. It's Kevin Nash. You never know what he's going to do. Is Sid going to win the world title? Is he going to somehow put the title on Kidman? That's what I would do, but we know that that's not going to happen. But anyway, kids, I just want to take a quick second and say thank you for being with us again for another year. We started this in 2020. We're at the end of 2021. I just want to take a second and wish you all a happy holiday and a very safe, a very happy Merry Christmas. Yeah, 100%. And uh, I have to say, folks, that we are absolutely astonished and floored by the viewership uh, that's been growing over the last several weeks and months. Uh, we are really indebted to you to keeping us going. We do this as a labor of love. It's a passion project for us. We really enjoy going back and going and, and uh, rebooking these events. But, you know, it is a commitment for us. It takes time. Sometimes it takes me a few hours, three, four hours to rebook these things after watching the events and stuff like that. I know the same is true for Tyrone, but we absolutely love but doing al- it. But also, I'm not going to lie, Jay, sometimes it takes me 10 minutes and I don't even watch the event. <laughs> well, I, that's, that's neither here nor there, Tyrone. If you're familiar with the pay-per-view, then I suppose that's, that's completely fine. You do a great job nonetheless. And I have to say that uh, with all that being said, um, we do it because we really enjoy doing it and we really enjoy putting this product out for you and presenting this product. And we are so grateful that you are tuning in and listening to what we're putting down and enjoying it. Feel free to leave us a comment. Um, you can find us on a couple of different avenues of social media, Tyrone, where would they find us on social media? On Facebook at good friends, better enemies, podcast, Twitter, good underscore enemies, And on Instagram at good double underscore enemies. As always, if you want to leave a comment, we are on the Counted Out 7 YouTube channel. You can drop a comment, tell us if you love us, hate us, like us a little bit, want us to cover something. We will answer your request. It is totally cool. You you let us know what you want us to do, and we will do it. That goes on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram as well. We always put up our show posters every single week. You want us to do something? Do it. And for everything else that we have going on and everything in the Counted Out 7 universe, you go to CountedOut7.com. Absolutely. And again, thank you very much, folks, for spending your time with us. We know it's precious. We know it's valuable. And we are grateful to have you along this journey with us. For myself, for Tyrone, for the holiday season, for NXT TakeOver London, for Jay's Rants and Tyrone's 10-minute booking choices, You've been listening to the Good Friends, Better Enemies podcast. Kidman better win the championship. Bye. In a tuxedo match.